Welcome, I'm Eric Singer, Gazette.com, and you are watching City Chat, where we go beyond the sound bites to get the real deal when it comes to the meat of the matter about City of Colorado Springs issues. And joining us as always, Mayor John Southers, thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. And of course, City Government Reporter with the Gazette, Billy Stanton Unlave. Thank you so much, thank as you, always, to be a co-host. Nice to be thank with you. Thank you for being here. Well, sadly, we have to t t take a moment to talk about this first, which the Black Friday shootings, a dark chapter in Colorado Springs history. Mayor Southers, you were at the epicenter of that, trying to help with the healing. Let's, let's focus as we've gone ahead now, post Black Friday. Uh, well, Eric, any city like ours uh, that's uh, recovering from this sort of a, uh, situation has to do a couple of things. Number one, we had to honor the victims. Uh, and I was just incredibly impressed by the outpouring of the citizens of Colorado Springs, not only at the funeral for Garrett Swayze, uh, that you know, lying the streets mm -hmm. uh, after the funeral uh, for the procession, um, public officials and others went to the other to the uh, funeral services for uh, other victims. Uh, we've given a great deal of support to the injured victims, and that's just what a community does to respond. Uh, we have to also honor the uh, incredible work of our first responders. Uh, I was there. I saw how they performed. I'm absolutely convinced that they saved lives in the process. We need to acknowledge that. And then, as a community, we have to be dedicated uh, to the notion that we are not going to be defined by these tragic events, but how we respond to them. You know, uh, this could have happened any place in America. Uh, I'm convinced it happened because Cairo Springs is closer to Hartzell. Uh, than any other major city. Mm -hmm. And that's why it happened in Colorado Springs. Uh, it was only a couple of days until the headlines moved to San Bernardino because that happened to happen there. Uh, but as a community, I'm very proud of the way that we've responded and uh, we're going to recover just as we have from the, the natural disasters uh, that we've had. And I think everybody in Colorado Springs is going to carry the message this is a fantastic place to live, work, and play. Billy? Mayor, you made a comment recently about the need for more attention to mental health when you were asked about gun control and whether there should be some tweaks to our gun control laws. And I'm curious, what did you mean exactly by more attention to mental health? Did you mean that in the context of gun control that there should be better checks? Or did you mean mental health services need to be increased? Both. All of the above? Uh, both. Um, I was uh, chairman of a... Uh, National Association of Attorney Generals Committee that was formed after the Virginia Tech incident. Uh, it was basically to update the findings of the Columbine Commission. You know, what had we learned since Columbine uh, to the Virginia Tech incident, uh, and, uh, you know, what, what should we concentrate on going forward? One of our findings was that there were very significant gaps uh, in the amount of uh, mental health information, court-ordered mental health commitments, and things like that, that were actually making them s their way into state and national databases that could be viewed by people who are doing background mm -hmm. checks. Most states uh, uh, and the federal government prohibit uh, uh, people with certain types of mental health history from getting uh, from purchasing weapons, but the information's got to be in the database. So that's one thing that we need to address and make sure that uh, all that uh, court-ordered commitment information is making the, its way to uh, the databases. Then we need to decide, are, is there other mental health information that would be appropriate to put into databases that would exclude uh, people from purchasing weapons? because so many of these cases have a mental health overlay. That, of course, raises serious questions about due process. For example, if uh, a family has a person committed uh, for a, a civil commitment for a short period of time, should that be a disqualifying thing? If it is, do we allow an individual who's denied uh, the ability to buy a weapon on that basis some kind of ability to go to court and say, I shouldn't be denied? Uh, it's much like the uh, debate that's going on right now about the no-fly list. Uh, people are saying, look, if the government is uh, suspicious enough of you, they put you on the no-fly list, you shouldn't be able to buy a weapon. Uh, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. On the other hand, uh, you can be put on the no-fly list without even your knowledge. So 
If you're banned from buying a weapon because you're on the no-fly list, you need some kind of due process right uh, mm -hmm. to take the government to task and say, I shouldn't be on that list, I should be able to buy a weapon. Uh, so I think then the other thing is the, our whole mental health services in America. In Congress, I do think for the first time in a long time is actually there's some bills in Congress kind of looking at you know, how, what do we, how do we deal with our whole mm -hmm. mental health system? People have to remember that in 1965, not that long ago, mm -hmm. there were 600,000 Americans in state mental health institutions. Today, despite the fact that the population has doubled, there's only 60,000. And so a lot of people that used to be uh, in mental institutions are now on our streets, unfortunately in our prisons, uh, under our bridges and things like that because mm -hmm. we've uh, the, the notion was that we would put them on psychotropic medications mm -hmm. and things like that that has o that uh, vision has only been partially realized a lot of the people don't have the support groups to keep them on the medication so we need to take an overall look at our mental health uh, systems and then we also need to specifically make sure that appropriate mental health information is getting into databases and can be the basis for exclusion of uh, buying a weapon. Okay. Okay. Then I guess my other question would mm -hmm. be, do you see, I know that gun control is kind of, that's a dirty phrase in El Paso County and much of America actually, but I'm wondering, do you see the need, I mean, I've, I've lived before with guns under the bed and I think that as a, if I were a woman living alone again, and wanted to have a pistol, I should be able to have a pistol. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. My brother in Tennessee should be able to have a shotgun if he wants to go hunting. I'm just wondering, do we really need citizens to have access to semi-automatic assault weapons, you know, high, high caliber magazines, high capacity magazines? Is there, is there a reason that, uh, you know, Joe Sixpack should be able to stockpile those kinds of guns? Well, the debate is what Joe Sixpack feels he needs to exercise his constitutional right to protect himself or to hunt. Um, when you ask your mayor who happens to have a background in constitutional law that question, you're going to get a, lot, um, a little bit of law. So here it goes. In the last several years, the United States Supreme Court has decided a couple of things. Number one, uh, the right to bear arms is an individual right that that individual Americans have, not contingent upon the existence of a militia or anything like that. Number two, uh, uh, not only the federal government can't uh, overly restrict the right to bear arms, but neither can the state or local governments. So now what's happened since those two important uh, Supreme Court cases is we're, we're starting to see a, a series of cases come out of the states where states like Colorado have, for example, bow, uh, um, prohibited uh, the number or, or put a cap on the number of rounds you can have. Colorado went with 15. Uh, California has 10. The federal district court in Colorado upheld the 15-round ban, and a very important case uh, yesterday was not decided by the Supreme Court. They decided not to take cert in a number of cases where people were appealing from assault weapon bans or uh, caps on the size of uh, magazines, um, they decide not to take the case. Seven to two, the Supreme Court uh, said we're not taking these cases, which upholds the lower court decisions. In the Supreme Court cases, the judges acknowledge that you can exclude people from having weapons for certain types of incompetencies, age, um, criminal records, mental health. They also made a broad statement that, you know, people can't have unlimited firepower. I think Scalia said, obviously, everybody can't have their own surface-to-air missile. So what we're going through in America now is legislatures passing certain types of laws and those being tested. Mm -hmm. The indication yesterday was the Supreme Court's not going to prohibit, you know, certain types of assault weapon bans and uh, bans on uh, the, the size of rounds in a magazine. But we have to have some realism about this. The state in the United States with the strictest gun laws is California. Mm -hmm. They ban assault weapons. They have a 10-round limit. Uh, that did nothing to prohibit uh, the tragedy in San Bernardino. And frankly, California's violent crime rates are probably much higher than the national average. So, um, you know, I, I know because I get letters from people 
uh, who I think would prefer the Second Amendment didn't exist. They, you know, they, they find it archaic. Well, the Second Amendment does exist. The First Amendment does exist. We've got to deal with it. The courts are going to deal with it. And we're going to see what kinds of, of cases uh, come, out, come out of it. And I think it, it's going to take some time, but at least the indication yesterday was that the Supreme Court is not going to say that all bans on automatic weapons, types, some types of automatic weapons, and, and uh, prohibitions on the size of magazines, it looks like they're going to let some of those prohibitions stand. All right. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. You bet. Now let's switch gears for just a moment. We're going to be talking about the growth of Colorado Springs and expansion. And we have one of your Facebook comments. Rob Henderson writes, any discussions with airlines like Virgin America to add service to Colorado Springs? Uh, I smile, Eric, because uh, uh, yes. Uh, and I can't, uh, it's just the nature of my job that I can't elaborate on the discussions that are going on. Um, airlines don't like that and don't, you know, these discussions do not take place uh, in a public sphere. Uh, but as I've said uh, on this city chat before, we've done a really good job on the uh, general aviation side of the airport. Mm -hmm. We've uh, brought in more companies, uh, they're paying leases, the airport's generating more income. That has allowed us to lower the fee that we charge commercial airlines, which call an emplanement fee, uh, from, it used to be $13 a seat, to, we're now at $6 a seat, and we think we can be at $4 in a couple of years. DIA, for example, is $15 a seat. That allows us to go to the airlines, and frankly, the airlines to come to us and say, hey, with those kinds of fees, this may be a little more profitable. And we're now in discussions about some expansion of airlines. Uh, I'm not going to tell you which airlines. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what destinations. But one of my major goals is to increase the direct destinations from mm -hmm. Colorado Springs. That's huge uh, for our economic development. As a lot of people read in the paper, uh, we've gotten some help. Um, three of our great foundation citizens and individuals, the Anschutz Foundation, mm -hmm the Elpamar Foundation and Lida Hill have agreed to put $6 million into an airport trust, which allow me as the mayor, as part of the negotiations with uh, private airlines to say, look, if you put in this destination, uh, we will you know, put $200,000 a year in promoting that destination mm -hmm. or other sorts of incentives. Um, so there's a lot going on and I feel very good uh, about uh, where we're at, and I hope that the next couple of months will bring some good news in that respect. All right. Okay. Well, bottom line, Rob, that was a wonderful question, and you heard it first here on City Chat from the Mayor. So now is your moment to be able to give some final thoughts, of course, to the City of Colorado Springs. Uh, you know, folks, I remain very optimistic about uh, a lot of issues in Colorado Springs. Uh, we're, we've got some resources to begin to fix our roads. Um, I have to spend the next couple of months giving an awful lot of attention uh, to stormwater issues because of uh, legal issues surrounding that. Uh, we are going to recover uh, from the, the tragedy that we had on the Friday after uh, Thanksgiving. Um, our unemployment rates uh, just uh, have reached uh, lows, you know, 4.3 percent. You've got to go back a long ways before Carmel Springs had an unemployment rate of 4.3 percent. We're actually getting very close to functional full employment. Um, and uh, what we got to do now is uh, work very hard to attract, uh, to nurture and promote companies that are here, uh, get more and more good uh, private sector employment, and get some companies to move here uh, so that we can all, um, you know, feel comfortable that if our children and grandchildren want to stay in Colorado Springs, they can find jobs that uh, fit their professional capabilities in their education. That really has to be our vision. All right. Thank you, Mayor. As uh, always, thank you. Mayor John Southers. Appreciate it. My co-host, Billy Eric. Stanton, LA. Uh, Billy, Major, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of the Gazette. And thank you for watching City Chat. We'll see you next time.